So if you have a, a Bible with you, I would encourage you to grab it and open to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible with you today, there are some out on the table there, right in the lobby. You're welcome to slip out at any point and grab a Bible. It is helpful to have a Bible in hand as you follow along with the, the message today. Uh, but then also, if, if you don't want to slip out, you can also find Bible apps on your phone. There are a lot of great Bible apps. Just search Bible in your app store, and I'm sure that you can find a great app. And then navigate your way to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6. Now, you'll remember that this book was written by the Apostle Paul, and it was written to a young pastor in the Greek city of Ephesus named Timothy. Timothy, who was called to work in this church to oppose false teaching, work to establish biblical church government and biblical church order. And now, Paul is at the, the end of his letter. We're not, this is not the final week. We're, we're going to have a, a few more weeks wrapping up first Timothy, but then we're going to be moving on to the book of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament after this. And so you remember that, that last week we, we talked about this warning for false teachers. And we said that the false teachers claim that godliness was a means of gain. And that was part of the, the sin of the false teachers, part of the bad fruit that came from their teaching. But then in a, in a really beautiful way, Paul nuances his argument. He says that the false teachers claim that godliness is a means to gain, and that's wrong. But then picking up in verse 7, sorry, verse 6, he says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can't take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we need the Holy Spirit today. I need the Holy Spirit to guide me as I teach and apply this message to our lives. We pray that you would give clarity of thought, clarity of heart, that I would have the, the words to speak that reflect truly what you are saying in this passage, and that everybody here would have ears to, ears to hear, Lord, eyes to see, that, that we could see Christ, that we can see our, our sin, that we can see our need for a Savior, and that you would shape us and mold us more into the image of Christ through this text. And so we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So one of the, the great questions that we face in life is this, are we content? And you can ask yourself that question today, are you content? Are you content with your job? Are you content with your home or your car or your marriage or your church or your level of education? If you keep going down the list, that the question is, are you content? Have you found the secret of contentment? And of course, even as I ask that question, are you content with your life, your, your marriage, your job? It sounds like the beginning of a bad commercial, because that, that's the, how commercials start, that the commercials spend millions and millions of dollars trying to say, here is some problem in your life, some problem you didn't even know you had, something that you didn't even know you needed that suddenly you realize that you've needed your entire life, and that if you only buy the right product, if you only fill it with the right service, that somehow through those things you can discover the secret of contentment, that you're discontented now, that if you heed the wisdom of the paid advertising, that suddenly you can have contentment in your life. 
But of course, I even see smiles on your face as I, as I say that because we know that it doesn't work, that you buy one thing to fill the void in your heart and it doesn't fill you up. You take one service and it doesn't fill you up. The, the goods and services of our world doesn't fill the very essence of what our heart is seeking. And if you were to boil down our text today, it's really saying that having more in this life isn't the secret of contentment. It's not the secret of contentment to have more. And we'll get in at the end to what it actually does bring contentment. But first, it's not having more that is the secret of contentment. So look in your Bible at verse 6, where Paul begins to unpack this. In verse 6, he says that godliness with contentment is great gain. And you say, why? He says, for we have brought nothing into the world, and we can't take anything out of the world, but if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. And so if you were to break this down, Paul is really offering a, a syllogism. And a syllogism has a, a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion. And so the, the major premise is we, we brought nothing into the world, that we come into the world with nothing in our name. The minor premise, we bring nothing out of the world. As much as that would be a disappointment to the Vikings who buried their dead in ships with gold or to the Egyptians who were laid in tombs with countless piles of gold and wealth, that it's true. We can't take anything out of this world. So those are the the major premise, the minor premise. Then the conclusion, if we have food and clothing... With these, we will be content. Now, as you look at that, he's, he's then commending this eternal perspective where we put our lives in the perspective of what is most important in light of the moment of our birth and the moment of our death. And he says that we can actually discover contentment with the absolute bare necessities of life. He says with food and clothing. Now, our need for food is fairly obvious that In the original language, the word for clothing is slightly wider and broader than it is in English, that that it could be covering. And so I think it would be right to to put under that food and adequate shelter. This is food and the covering that we need to protect ourselves from the elements. So he's saying that if you have food and you have clothing and adequate shelter, with these we will be content. And you think about that. And it's the type of thing that that you can nod your head and say, yes, that's true. But then you ask yourself, is that really true? Do you live your life as if that is true? And I think often we don't live as if that is reality. That we think we need much more than food and clothing. Because we always think that the next thing is going to satisfy. Or we try to see, see our life as a web. Where, I mean, for those of you who have been without a car, you know, okay, I need a car to get to work so I can make money so that I can buy food and pay my rent, that these things seem more interconnected, that it could seem simplistic. But as we put this to the test and we think about what Paul is saying, that we realize that it's profoundly true, that having more in this life is not the secret of contentment. And you can think about celebrities, Most celebrities have far more than you do, um, both in in the way of talent, or I'll put myself, in the way of talent and wealth, right? But yet we look at celebrities and does their great talent and their great wealth buy contentment? Does it buy happiness? And you look at the rich and the powerful and the, the successful in the world, and you realize that rarely are they more content more satisfied and happier than those with less. And so it seems to confirm the idea that it's not through more that we find the secret to contentment. Or you could think of Vladimir Putin, somebody who's in the news a lot these days. I heard that he's one of the richest people in the world. He rules one of the largest countries in the world. But you wonder, is Vladimir Putin content? And clearly not, that there's something missing. He needs something more 
for his life to be complete or his legacy or his, his country. And so you see then that, that having more in this life isn't the secret of contentment. But of course, it's not just Vladimir Putin and elite celebrities who fall into this trap. I see many pastors who could fall into this trap as well, that as pastors, it's easy to, to think that, well, if only my church were bigger, if only we had more programs, or if only we were growing faster, then I would be content. Then I would have what really matters. And I can struggle with that even as a church planter who desires a young church plant like Hope Church to grow and to become self-sustaining, to have our own leadership. That's a good thing to desire. It's not bad to desire. But I would have to face the question of where is my contentment coming from? Would I think that I would be happier or more content? And again, I can just subject that to a, a little bit of critical reasoning to see that as I, as I look around at other pastors, I know pastors of megachurches who are miserable and discontented. I know pastors of growing churches who are miserable and discontented. I know pastors of small, struggling churches that are content and joyful in the Lord. And so apparently it's not having more that's the secret. It's not having more that's the answer for life. But then you say, well, that's true for you. That might be true for most others. But I have a lot of needs in my life. You don't understand how many needs I have. And I'm not asking to be the richest person in the world. I'm, I'm not asking to run a country. All I'm asking is just to be able to make ends meet. All I'm asking is for a nice, comfortable, secure lifestyle. And if I had just that basic level of security in my life, then I would be content. So maybe you say, I would be content if I just had a bigger car or a bigger house or more education or if I got married or if I got unmarried, or if I had children, or I get my children out of the house. Whatever it is, you, you say, if, if I have this thing, then I'll have contentment. Then I'll have happiness. Then I'll be complete. But you say, where does your contentment come from? Does it come from your IQ? Does it come from your 401k? Does it come from your talent? Does it come from your good looks or your health? What is the source of your contentment? And of course, our culture tends to put wealth and money at the very center of contentment. And at first that makes sense because money can buy so much. That money unlocks so many things in life. You want food and clothing, well, you say, I need money. And so Paul says, if I have food and clothing, I'll be content. But you say, I need money to have those things. You need money to be able to, to work, money to be able to advance. You need money to, to provide for your children, to provide for your house. And didn't Paul earlier in this letter say that if someone doesn't care for their own household and especially members of, their, you know, that members of the household of God, that they have denied the faith and are worse than an unbeliever? Paul commands people to provide for their families. And so I'm not out for wealth. I'm just trying to care for my family. I think that's what we say so often in an attempt to justify ourselves in the pursuit of wealth. And that quite often this, this sense of I need money can turn into an overriding direction for your life where you say, why am I here in this world? What is the purpose of my life? That the purpose of your life becomes nothing more than growing your retirement, growing your bank account, growing your home, getting the next best iPhone, getting the next best thing that comes along. And that is the center of your life. That's what you're living for. That's what you spend your time doing. But of course, according to verse 9, if you look at verse 9 in your Bible, Paul tells us, the, us that this pursuit of wealth for wealth's sake, this love of, of money, this desire for riches is profoundly dangerous. So look at verse 9. He says, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. 
And so do you want ruin and destruction in your life? And maybe your life is on the train right now to ruin and destruction. That's where your life is going. And you don't even recognize it because your whole life is lived, he says, for the desire of riches. And you say, well, I'm not rich. I don't have to worry about this. But notice he says that it's the desire to be rich. That's the problem. That it's not even riches themselves. That's the problem. It's the desire. It doesn't bring contentment. And you can think of the, the movie Citizen Kane, old classic movie. Some of you have seen it. Some of you may not have seen it. My roommate in college was a filmmaker, and apparently people who know films claim that it's the, the greatest movie ever made. And so you can watch it to see if that's true. But it's about a media tycoon, this wealthy, rich man. And it, it starts with this man, Kane, on his deathbed in this enormous mansion with, with servants. And as he's dying, he utters the word rosebud. And that's reported in the news. This rich, powerful man said rosebud as he was dying. What does that mean? And so then a journalist begins to explore the question, what does rosebud mean? He interviews his ex-wife. He interviews his former business associates. He begins to read his, his diaries and his writings. And he is never able to discover the meaning of rosebud. He can't uncover it. But yet, through the process of exploring this deceased man's life, he discovers that, yes, he was rich, yes, he was powerful, yes, he had a mansion and servants, but he was a miserable and piteous person, that, that he was not the type of person that you would want to be, that he destroyed all of the relationships in his life. He ruined his life in the pursuit of wealth and influence. And so the, the movie ends, and here's the 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 spoiler alert. Somebody said recently that if something's been around for several decades, that it's open game for spoiling it because you've had the opportunity. Um, but at the at the very end, uh, it, they're they're pulling all the things out of his house, all of his worldly possessions, selling off what was valuable. But anything that seemed worthless, they they were throwing into a furnace to burn. And so they they take Cain's childhood sled. And they, they throw it into the furnace, and then the camera zooms in, and you see Rosebud written on the sled. Um, and, and, it, what it, and what you start to see is that at the very beginning of the movie, he was out playing in the snow when he was sent away by his parents to pursue this life of success and affluence. And, and apparently, the, he was on his deathbed re reflecting on this childhood sled that that, it, that one sled was the moment of contentment. That was the only time that he was happy. That was the only time he actually had what was valuable in his life. And it was just a sled. It wasn't the mansion. It wasn't all the other things in life. But yet the, the tragedy of the movie is that that memory dies with Cain. No one knows what that word means. The very object, the only thing that brought him contentment in life is burned up in the fire as all of his wealth is sold away and he takes nothing with him. And so you say, well, Cain brought nothing into the world. He could take nothing out of the world, but he never learned the secret of contentment. And so think about this for your life. Will you... Learn the secret of contentment before it's too late? Or will you continue to rationalize your greed? Will you continue to rationalize your avarice, saying, oh, it's just the American dream. It's just me being committed to my work. It's just me being a diligent employee. And using the language of our text, will you plunge yourself into ruin and misery, into Senseless snares, harmful desires. Is this where your life will end up? Or will we heed the warning of verse 10? So look in your Bible at verse 10, this final verse of our text. Paul says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. 
It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. So again, Paul is raising the stakes that it's not that people who have true saving faith lose their faith, but the faith is in the objective religion of Christianity that people wander away from the gospel. You could think of the, the parable that Jesus tells of the sower and those who were, were, were sown among weeds, that they, they grow up with the weeds and then they're choked by the deceitfulness of riches and the cares of this world, that that's what he's saying can happen. But notice an important detail, though. He says, sometimes when this is quoted, people say, money is the root of all evil. But look at the actual language of the text. He says, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And so he's not saying that, that money itself is the problem. It's not wealth it, itself that is the problem. And by extension, it's not having money that's the problem. But what he says here is that it's the, the love of money that's the problem. It's the love of money, the desire for riches that ends up being the snare. And of course, that could be a, could be a good news, I suppose, that, that if, if, if money itself was the problem, well, maybe the, 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 the solution would seem simple. Well, just get rid of all your wealth. Money is the root of all evil. Just give it all away. And some in church history have thought that, that money itself is the problem. So let's divest ourselves of all of our worldly possessions, move out into the desert and become desert monks. Then we will be content because we will have nothing. We'll, we'll be living out as hermits in the wilderness is that the solution? Is that what Paul is calling us to do? Well, maybe if it said the love of the that money is the root of all evil, that would be the solution. But the fact he says the love of money is the problem. Well, look here at your text. He says that that, that so the problem is isn't money per se. It's the the love of money. And even if you moved out into the desert without anything in your name. The love of money could pursue you because the love of money is in your heart. And so the problem is deeper than just our external possessions. And I think this is where minimalism in our culture can actually go off the rails. And, and I think that there is a place for minimalism. If, if you know, this is kind of a popular hit thing. And I'm a fan of the idea of downsizing or moving into smaller spaces that, that I think often in life we have more than we really need, and sometimes simplifying can be a really good thing. But I think that just pursuing minimalism apart from the heart of the gospel that we'll get to, but just pursuing downsizing is another lie in a sense, because it's saying that, that it's our possessions that are the problem. And if only you simplify enough, then you can find happiness and contentment. But it's just the opposite form of the same problem, that, that our culture says the problem is you don't have enough. And if you had more, then you would be happy and content. Minimalism says that, that if only you could downsize enough and, and live simple enough life, then you would be happy and content. But the thing is, is that according to the Bible, it's not having more, it's not having less. That's not the root of the problem, that the root of the problem here is the love of money. Let's think for a moment about the, the love of money. Do you love money? I think that you could apply different questions based on whether you're poor or rich. So if you consider yourself poor, if you're struggling to, to make ends meet, well, it, it's still possible to love money, even if you don't have a lot. But you could ask yourself questions like this. What is my life goal? Am I only worthy working to make money? Or am I working to use my gifts to, to serve my neighbor, to serve the Lord, to be diligent in what he's giving me? You say, how do I view those who are more wealthy than myself? Am I envious? Do I want what they have? Have I bought into the lie that if I only had more, then I would be happy, then I would be content? And if so, even if you don't have a lot, you could still struggle with the love of money. But what if you have a lot? What if you are wealthy? 
And of course, probably every single one of us here in this room would be considered wealthy in most places around the world. And so we, we, have, we have to be careful of putting ourselves, well, I'm not as wealthy as the guy down the street, but compared to most, we are all wealthy. And so I think then we can ask ourselves, as, as those who have a lot, who have a lot of gifts from the Lord, how do we know if we just have money or if we love money? And so we can ask ourselves questions like this. How would you feel if inflation continues, if it increases, and all of your savings are rendered pretty much worthless? How would you feel? How would you feel if at this very moment, a hacker is breaking into your bank accounts and cleaning everything out? How would you feel if a identity theft at this very moment is posing to be you checking into hotels and ruining your credit score? How would you feel if your house burned to the ground tonight with all of your material possessions in it? How would you feel if the economy crashes and then suddenly all the things you have were, are not worth anything? How would you feel if you were in the position of so many right now in Ukraine, fleeing their homes, fleeing everything in the face of an invading army? If, if everything in your material world started to collapse, would you feel like you've lost everything? Would you feel like life isn't worth living? Would you feel like you have nothing left? And if so, then I think that we have a problem with the love of money. And I know that probably all of us struggle to one degree with the love of money because we would react in a way that shows that we were trusting not in the Lord, but in our material possessions. So would we respond as if all things were over or would we respond like Job when he found out that he had lost everything? He put his life in that eternal perspective that Paul commends. He says, naked, I came from my mother's womb and naked, I shall return. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So where then does true lasting contentment come from? Is it your work? Is it your circumstances? Well, in the, one of the, the greatest books on contentment, if you ever get your hand on it, is a, by a 16th century guy, or sorry, a 17th century English Puritan named Jeremiah Burroughs. And he wrote a little book called The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. And it's really not that hard to read if you get your hands on it. But this is what he says about contentment. That He says, contentment is not by addition, but subtraction. Seeking to add a thing will not bring contentment. Instead, subtracting from your desires until you are satisfied only with Christ brings contentment contentment. And then he continues, he says that the one drop of the sweetness of heaven is enough to take away the sourness and the bitterness of all the afflictions of the world. And then continuing again, he says, though I have not outward comforts and worldly conveniences to supply my necessities, yet I have a sufficient portion between Christ and my soul abundantly to supply and to satisfy me in every condition. That if you have an abundant supply of Christ, if you have Jesus, then you have the rare jewel of Christian contentment. You have something that can bring true satisfaction. You have something that can bring true joy. Because you have something that, that can be with you through your life. Something, the only thing that can follow you from this life into the next is your relationship with Christ. That's the only thing you could take with you. And if you have repented and trusted in Christ for salvation, then you are adopted, you're God's child, you're, you're clothed in the righteousness of Christ, that you have an inheritance beyond all of your imagination. And so what is a, a mere possession in this life compared to Christ? That you can lose everything in this life, but if you have Christ, you have ultimately what matters. You have what can bring you safely through, that Christ is the great ferryman who will guide you through from this life into the life to come because he is gracious and merciful and, and good and cares for us on every level of our life, that, that having Jesus is the answer. And if we have Christ, then we can profess the words of Paul in Philippians 4, 
where he says, not that I am, I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In every circumstance, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Let's pray. Father, we profess today that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Lord, we admit that we are captivated so often by the love of money. Even though we are unwilling to see it and unwilling to admit it, that we look to our bank accounts for our stability more than we look to you. And so today, Father, whether we have a lot in the way of material possessions or whether we're, we're struggling, we pray that we could find our true satisfaction in Christ alone, that we could say that we have Christ and we have enough, that, that Jesus would be sufficient for us. And Lord, and while we, we, pry, we do pray for the provision of basic food and, and shelter and, and clothing, and that we wouldn't see any in need of those things, we know that, that adding more and more and more will never truly bring us to the place of contentment. And so, Father, we pray that, that in our, our work that we would be diligent, that we'd be diligent in our vocations, we, we would work hard, we would seek to use our gifts, but that we would use our, our talents and our gifts in the world and in the workplace, not just to make more money, uh, not just to try to purchase a feeling of contentment and security, but that we would serve out of love for our neighbor, out of a love for Christ with the stability of knowing that we already have everything that we need. And so anything else that we have in life is just an overflow of your blessing, that what we deserve is hell, what we deserve is separation from Christ forever. And so if we have anything in this life short of hell, that we already are experiencing grace, but yet you lavish your grace upon us so freely, uh, so abundantly, but we pray that your your gifts in our life wouldn't blind us to the giver, that we wouldn't be blinded to you, Father, who bestows the gifts, and that we would seek Christ alone. And we pray in his name. Amen.